Our, our next speakers. Uh, so our, our next speakers are Jack Roberts and Kate Courts, uh, who will be presenting on Towards Equitable Decision Making in Smart Cities. Hi there. So we're going to speak about um, our experience on a recent project between Newcastle University and the Turing Institute. I'm an RSE here at Newcastle. And when I hand over to Jack, I'll let him introduce himself. And um, so we'll give you some background about the project itself and the technical development. We'll show you the tool that came out of that project and we'll kind of start at the end by showing you the tool. So that then you can understand the, the kind of second half of the talk where we'll talk about um, some of the conceptual decisions about balancing different priorities and then how we feel we worked really well as quite a diverse team, including RSEs. Thanks. So yeah, I'm, I'm Jack. I work at the Research Engineering Group at the Turing and I'm going to start by giving you some context about uh, what this project is trying to do. Um, and to do that, I'm going to kind of go through all the words in the title starting at the end here with uh, what are smart cities. Uh, and as you know now, we don't ask Google questions. We, we ask DALI questions. And uh, so this is a smart city. Um, it's kind of got lots of futuristic buildings. So we're talking about cities of the future. We're hoping the future is nice and green. So we've got lots of, lots of fields and things. And then there's also all these weird orbs around um, where it's kind of indicating sensors, so we want to use data to improve the efficiency and, and the way our, our cities work. But also maybe there's worries about Big Brother in this, and there's kind of worries about surveillance and, and so on. Um, but the, the city we're in now, Newcastle, is a smart city itself. So in Newcastle, we have the Urban Observatory, which has sensors around the city of many different types. So you see down the left here, you've got air quality, noise, traffic, all kinds of different things. Uh, and you can go online to their website and see where the sensors are around the city and get like measurements from those those sensors. Um, so moving on to the the next part of the title is this word equitable, um, and specifically inequality in cities. Um, so this is a UN report from a few years ago now, which says that inequality in a lot of cities around the world is actually increasing over the, over time rather than decreasing. And so there's an, an emphasis in this report of thinking about the future of cities with a focus on trying to reduce inequality in cities and stop this, this increase over time. Uh, so then you can uh, start to ask, like, what are, what are smart cities doing about uh, equality in cities and what decisions are people making in smart cities that might be impacting people? And so it's, sorry for the red-green color scale, but this is a plot of um, where air quality sensors, we focus on air quality specifically for this project. So this is a map of where air quality sensors are around Newcastle in the Urban Observatory. And the color scale is the index of multiple deprivation. And on this next slide, I've tried to, this is just by hand, try to highlight the areas of a city that are the most deprived. And in a bit of a hand wavy way, you can kind of see that there's a there's a big group of sensors in this city center. Maybe I can use this. Where is it? There it is down here. Um, and then you can see the other like green areas of a city where there are quite a lot of sensors, but you have huge of the huge of the huge areas of the most deprived places in the city have very few sensors, like over here, for example, there's nothing, or, or up here. So in this way, you can kind of see that maybe smart cities are risking increasing inequality in these places because people are not, maybe not thinking in the right way about where we should be placing uh, sensors in smart cities. So this, this project was all about like thinking about how we should maybe influence the decision process in where in smart city infrastructure should go in a way that is equitable and trying to re reduce inequality in cities rather than exacerbating inequalities that are already there. Okay, so I said we're going to show you what we made and, and then we'll tell you how we made it. So, oh, you need to request permission to view this video. Okay, well, I'll talk you through the tool. Okay, so um, we made a decision support tool and um, this is aimed at 
decision makers very loosely. So people maybe in a city council, um, maybe the public, probably more city council context. And there's two main functions of the tool. The first is to give those decision makers data. So this data is already available out there. We've just collected it together. Um, predominantly from ONS, so that picture in the, um, the left-hand side there, you can see down there's lots of different, uh, different layers. And they, we wanted to kind of unify how that data was presented. So we came up with presenting that as, as density, and we've chosen density to be represented by um, taking the number of people with that characteristic from the whole local authority, so we're looking at local authority level, and then looking at how they're distributed across output areas. So each of those kind of little shapes you can see, um, that, that's an output area there. That's roughly the smallest, most grand granular level we could find the data for. It's about 1,000 people. So um, you can see there that um, we've chosen under 16s to look at there. Um, broadly speaking, there's maybe more in the west of the city there, slightly darker, but fairly even. So, um, Decision makers can browse through those different layers. There's also things like schools. Um, so we're going to go on to talk about a bit more about kind of risks and hazards and vulnerabilities around air quality, because that's what we're interested in here. But you can see we're starting to think about some of the different things a decision maker might need. Uh, so the second feature of this tool is being able to view some suggested networks. And Jack's going to tell you how those networks are created. So a user can come along and think about, well, what are my priority areas? And some of those data layers on the right-hand side there, they can choose to make a priority area. So you might choose, for example, um, older people and um, particularly younger people. And when you've chosen your um, objectives, you might also put in the number of sensors. And then also this value that we've called theta. And we've used this to represent some kind of value of coverage per sensor. And that's not the actual area that particular air quality sensor can measure. Instead, it's the area that we've decided um, people feel covered by a sensor if they're in the vicinity of it. So we're concerned much more here with um, people's perception of those sensors. So those, uh, the user is then presented with 200 possible networks across the city, and they can view them on that graph there, apologies that it's a bit small, um, per objective. So I can look at that and think, actually, uh, um, there might be a network that performs very well in terms of covering an older population, but oh, that, that actually doesn't perform quite so well covering a younger population. So the user's presented with those. They can choose one to view on the map there. We also wanted to include some human decision making in this. This is not just to present a network that we think, yes, you should go out and you should buy those sensors and put them in straight away. It's about experimenting. So the user can also drag and drop sensors, delete sensors, add sensors, and that coverage, that notion of coverage, will be updated all the time. So they'll be able to see a kind of some kind of numerical representation of the success or not, or the gains of losses in that network. Um, you can see on the map there that um, there are shadings for different grades of, um, in different grades of green. The darker green represents an output area that is very well served by an out, uh, a sensor, so it's got a sensor in it. Whereas um, the ones that are um, paler green, they go away from the sensor. And that's where that notion that I mentioned of theta or that kind of satisfaction coverage comes in. So um, two main functions, the data, but then also being able to see these possible networks and explore them. Yep. Um, oh, yes, that's not me. That's all right. Uh, that was also my fault for the church. I think we tried to put a video in the, in the slides. But um, yeah, so we're going to kind of go through the sort of process we went through that ended up in this decision support tool. Uh, and our starting point was thinking about what kind of, imagining you're thinking about where you want to place sensors in the city, what kind of things you might want to incorporate in that decision. Uh, and we started with this idea of the risk triangle where you want to think about where the hazards are in the city, so where, where the air quality is actually likely to be poor, um, 
where people actually are in the city and if they're actually getting exposed to pollution uh, and how vulnerable those those people are like if they're elderly or have health conditions for example uh, we're not going to go into detail as much about the specifics of the data we're using we kind of mostly just used uh, some census data as a kind of prototype of what we were showing but you can imagine all kinds of data sets that fit into these three categories like uh, again where people live by by age and health where they where they work so there you're also trying to get where people are during the day and where people are during the, the evening uh, maybe where tourists are or like points of interest where children are in schools where people with health conditions might be uh, and then on the more like hazard side where traffic is where maybe certain like industrial uses are also things like uh, you have this effect called uh, building canyons where if you have traffic in an area which has like built high buildings closing you in the the air quality is much likely to be a lot worse there than if you have like a big open space around the world around the, the road uh, so we've got all these different data sources that you could think of including in this decision and then what we're kind of left with is a good old-fashioned optimization problem which is a variant of this this maximum coverage location problem um, where we have some sensors that we want to place around the city so that's the location problem part of this we want to maximize some concept of coverage which is where the optimization is coming in and this this coverage is some mixture of uh, the area over which a sensor gives you a, a meaningful measurement um, the area over which the community feels they are being included in the smart city and how much um, how important importance probably not the right word but how important that area is in terms of where it sits in this risk triangle like if, are people there is pollution likely to be poor there are the people there vulnerable um, and then we need to think about how we present the or how a how we'd want to present the results of this optimization or the decisions that go into this optimization how you should present those to a, a non-technical a potentially non-technical decision maker in in the council or, or wherever is making these choices um, again i'm not going to talk about the technical details of the optimization but in terms of the decisions someone's making in a kind of classical single objective setup the the choice you have to make is so you've got the the circles at the top are representing like the different data sources you might want to include like things relating to where people live where pollution is bad and so on and and the choice you have to make comes before you run the optimization so you have to choose what weighting factor you give each of these different data sources before you run your maximize maximization algorithm um, one of the issues with this is that it's quite it's not necessarily intuitive what effect changing the weights on at the beginning is going to have in how those different concepts are prioritized in the resulting network um, and so what we found to be more intuitive and what I didn't have experience with, with before this project are some of these multi-objective optimization approaches which a lot of them are based on genetic algorithms uh, and in this case rather than having to specify weights at the beginning uh, you run a population based optimization so that the output of these of this algorithm is like a population of networks and within that population are networks that are kind of optimal for different combinations of the objectives and so in this case now the decision that uh, a human decision maker has to make is which of these configurations of sensors fits my concept of priorities the the best and you can really directly see kind of you, you don't have this kind of black box in the way in the sense like you see actually the the different the different choices you you have um, so this is the one we highlighted in the decision support tool in the end uh, yeah and back to Kate so 
why do we need this tool? Who cares about it? Um, we did a few stakeholder engagement activities. Um, we interviewed some decision makers who we think might be our audience, so city council members and experts, people from the Urban Observatory here in Newcastle. And we also did a workshop with um, students here in Newcastle. And in the workshop, we asked them to imagine what a future where um, all cities were smart would be like. So to think through how they, that would make them feel. And then also we asked them to map an area that they were really familiar with. So you can just see some of the outputs from that workshop there. And that was ask, um, getting them to think about what air quality means to them, what their experience of air quality might be. Um, so. The, the, the themes that came out of that were that people are really concerned and they're aware of hazards and exposures, but they're also they're aware of like the negative side of surveillance. We also realized we really wanted to make mo the most of the community knowledge. That's where the human decision making that I talked about before came in. And then also this impression that cities are already smart or they're getting ready to be smart. People are making decisions already about where air quality sensors go and they don't have the data at their fingertips to start to help them explore some of their balancing priorities. I'm not going to talk about in detail about how we implemented the front end, particularly because this is a machine learning session. But if you're interested, those are the technologies that we used. And um, really, the, the key takeaway from this slide is that we wanted to create a thinking tool. So it's not an end. We've, it's called a decision support tool, but it's not the end of the line. It's helping you think through in the middle bit of that decision making. Uh, so this is one quick example of the types of decisions that you might be faced with, even if you only take into account two different data sets. So on the left here is a network optimized only for covering workplaces. Uh, and uh, the circles here are where the algorithms decided to place sensors. And uh, the color scale in the background gives an area of how covered or not each area in the city. This is, this is also Newcastle. I don't know whether we said that before, but like, uh, <laughs> that's the river. And then this area is the, the Newcastle local authority. Um, so this is for workplaces. And then on the right, we have one which is optimized for covering the over 65s only. And there's a couple of things to notice here. So the, the first is look, looking at the, the city center at the bottom here. Um, the, the one priori prioritizing workplaces is most similar to the current urban observatory network. Uh, and you place more sensors in the city center because more people work in the city center, obviously. On the other hand, on the right, very few over 65s live in the city center. So if your priority is covering vulnerable people who might be elderly people, then maybe you want to place much less weight on the, the city center for where you're monitoring air quality in your city. The second thing is that uh, looking at the like, overall coverage numbers at the top, because where people work is much more concentrated, you get kind of more bang for your buck from a sensor. So you can cover more of, more of workplaces with a fixed number of sensors than, or, than, the, than the over 65. So even with like, a quite simple example like this, you have um, interesting trade-offs. We have one minute to quickly rush through. <laughs> uh, we're going to just quickly talk at the end about how collaboration worked on this project. So the project happened in two phases. The first phase ended with some global event at the start of 2020. Um, we had, so we're going to just highlight a few things that we thought were interesting about the project. We had multiple groups involved. So we had Center for Urban and Regional Development Studies in Newcastle, who are bringing like the geography, geographical, uh, urban domain expertise. We had Newcastle RSC team and the Turing Research Engineering team with most of the software engineering expertise coming from Newcastle and me on the data science like optimization side. Um, and we we're all really contributing equally from the beginning as researchers and with RSCs involved from the beginning as well. And then the second phase. If I, that's one. So this phase was really characterized by remote working for everyone. But actually, we wanted to just reflect that that, that actually worked really well for a team that was based 
kind of largely in Newcastle, but then also with remote me members, because it meant suddenly we were able to do lots of exciting things about helping us. So we realized we needed thinking tools as well as we were creating a thinking tool. So I will stop talking. Um, so uh, we use things like Miro and we had a, a Miro board that was both um, collecting technical decisions and conceptual decisions together. Um, so we, we won't go into detail about the other things, but um, the kind of core message in terms of how we felt the team was effective was that we weren't, even though we weren't domain experts, we weren't kind of separate from the team. We found ways to think through these ideas together. I'd love to hear more, but we have to move on. We've got five minutes for questions, though, so please, again, try and take as many as you can from the slider board and also the folks in the room. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, so the first one is, is it possible to generalize the metric of coverage to sensor types without a clear radius of influence, footfall, cameras, bin sensors? Jack, I think you should answer that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this the concept of coverage is tricky in in general. Um, but I, th I think arguably a more, uh, at least for people from a more data science model-y background, the more natural way of thinking about coverage might have been in terms of the distance over which a sensor gives an accurate measurement, or in terms of where you should place sensors in order to minimize the error in some air quality model, whereas for, for this, we are much more focused on where we should place infrastructure with a focus on equality and minimizing inequalities, making sure each community is included. Um, so in that sense, I think the answer to this question is yes, because you're not, uh, the, s the question's gone now, hasn't it? <laughs> um, but um, you're not so focused on like what the camera can see, for example. You're you're interested in whether there's a camera or not. Um, so it's more about making sure each community is covered by the infrastructure. Than cameras are a bad, bad example because then you're thinking about surveillance again. But um, yeah, D depending on how you frame coverage, uh, oh, it's back again. Um, the way we framed it, I think the answer to this question is yes, but I could ramble on about it for ages. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe I should look at the next one. Uh, maybe I can pass this on to you, Kay, but how, how do local communities feel about being observed by the sensor network? Uh, yeah. yeah, good question. So um, we, the, the project is really based on the assumption that um, having a, an, a distribution of, of sensors around a city is a good thing. So we're making an assumption there for the purposes of being able to explore those ideas in this project. But you're totally right that during that workshop, we had a lot of discussions about whether actually um, there was a, a kind of malicious intent behind this idea of watching what people were doing. But actually, we chose air quality sensors really deliberately because we felt that was perhaps a more, um, a less kind of contentious type of sensor in that it's easier to see how better understanding the quality of the air that we're breathing in is going to benefit us all and should be kind of fairly spread around. But you're right, if we're going to talk about other aspects of a smart city, particularly things like cameras, then that would become much more um, of an issue. Uh, okay, so uh, who owns the census data used in your work? So the Urban Observatory um, have that network of sensors already. Um, we didn't place any sensors at all. This was this project kind of fell much earlier in the life cycle of building a smart city, I guess. Um, and then the data, um, maybe Jack, you would be. Oh yeah, so the, the data, um Again, partially urban observatory for like data related to where the current sensors are and so on. Um, then most of what we used was census data, so ONS owned it. Uh, yeah. Uh, did we have any interest in the in the tool? Um, I'd hesitate slightly from calling it automatic recommendations, maybe, but um, yes, there was. So we had discussions with. Uh, so Newcastle is quite. 
advanced as a smart city. There's other urban observatories around the country, like Manchester, Sheffield, West Bristol, I think, off the top of my head. And we had interest from at least a few of those in being more involved like, at the level of conception before before sensors have been placed. Uh, we also had discussions with Gateshead Council um, and a few others. So yes, yes, there was <laughs> in brief. Are we out of time or one, one more? Can we extract the weights that the human deci decision maker implicitly picked from the decision they've made? Uh, is that interesting? Well, I can like pretend that I've got something I could prepared earlier here. So we did also look at um, like comparing some of our generated networks to the current um, urban observatory network. So these are uh, all these permissions things again. But so e each one of these is a comparison of an, a network that we generated to maximize coverage of a single objective given by the title and where sensors are currently placed in the urban observatory network, where areas in orange, in each case, kind of have a deficit of coverage by according to our, our approach. Um, so again, I can mention it during the talk, but the one which has like the least, the least orange and purple and the most weight is the workers' network. So the one, the weights that current decision makers are using, if you like, are most similar to heavily favoring workplaces or the city centre. <laughs>